Emma, it's so nice to meet you in the flesh. Yes, it's lovely to meet you as well, yeah. Having followed you on Instagram, and we were on a Zoom once together for the Pass the Mic initiative. Oh my goodness, yeah. 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 And but this is our first time meeting, so I'm really and I've loved reading your books as well. So it's great to be able to look into your eyes and have a proper meaty chat. So I'd love to get stuck into talking about your latest book, Disobedient Bodies, which just saying it out loud is a very freeing statement. Ah. But what does disobedient bodies mean to you? How would you how would you summarize that? Yeah, so I think for me disobedient bo- disobedient bodies can be like many different things, but I think primarily um what I am aiming for with that with that name with that title is achieving a sense of um enjoyment and comfort and confidence in the experience of being embodied, of of having a body, actually being able to enjoy having a body rather than feeling like it's something that you are plagued with insecurity about, that you are constantly policing and worrying about the appearance of, um, that you can actually just kind of confidently inhabit your body and, and, and enjoy it. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> hey, hey. I mean, podcast done. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because um, it's so interesting, you know, the like human evolution has given us some exquisite opportunities. But one of the things that is probably sort of the, the pits of human evolution is our absolute obsession with the exterior and our, our outward facing aesthetic. We've mm-hmm. become so bloody obsessed by it would you say we've reached fever pitch is this the worst it's been um I would I would say that we've reached fever pitch yeah I would say like so in the book I talk about like kind of having like we've got beauty standards but like on speed and I think a lot of that has to do or lies with um the level to which we inhabit um you know the 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 digital realm um and where it's not um it's these representations these visual representations of of ourselves um that we are that 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 we're or, or and of other people that we're engaging with so everything is you know about like photographs and images and representations of of ourselves and so is to a far greater degree based on our based on the visual based on our physical appearance than things so I I talk a lot about like growing up being a teenager in the 90s and the pressures that existed um, then but how those pressures still very much exist but feel like really accelerated and feel really turbocharged by the fact that we inhabit this visual this digital visual landscape and also this visual economy because it's also um, it's also that landscape is also very much connected to how kind of successful we are perceived as yeah well, it's been monetized yeah completely exactly it's it's wild um i loved your reference of heather shimmer lipstick <laughs> in the book because i'm very much of the same era as you and heather shimmer lipstick was the one and it was kind of it was a strange color and it was very very sheeny yeah we i don't know if it's the same in ireland but we had to apply a very dark brown lip liner and then heather shimmer over the top Yes, there was a, a, a contrasting lip liner <laughs> that was least. that was that was part of the look. Um, apparently, they've just re-issued um, Heather Shimmer. So apparently, oh, it's, I don't think I could do it again. I don't know. I don't know that I'd do it again. But I, <laughs> I'd love to just. I'd love to put some on and just, just to see. see. Yeah, just to see. Mm. And um, I posted a picture recently of me at about eighteen or nineteen. I don't know that I'm wearing Heather Shimmer, but I'm definitely. I've definitely got that very two tone <laughs> lip liner and lipstick effect going on but it was actually so interesting how much people were like oh my god that's such a nice especially younger people I think people my age you know kind of like looked at it in, 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 in one way but I think for younger people a lot of people are like oh my god that's so iconic yeah and I'm like that's hilarious yeah we are now a throwback <laughs> yeah, that's where we're at <laughs> we're vintage <laughs> we really are and we're seeing things come back and it's absolutely terrifying I liked hearing you talk about that era of your life 
I mean, again, the whole conversation is complex around disobedient bodies and we'll hopefully touch on all of it. But there's this lovely side to growing up with girlfriends and getting ready together and putting your makeup on and the sort of ritual side of things, which, again, adds a whole other layer because when we're having this conversation and we're talking about beauty standards or the pressure that women particularly feel with applying makeup or changing their appearance in any way... We can't see the solution as bin the makeup bag. I'm never doing anything like that ever again. I'm not going to you know, wear makeup, change my hair, dress in a certain way. I don't care about it. Because actually there's real magic in the lovely side of it. So the solution isn't just to go be gone all of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm really trying to do in the book is, first of all, identify and then challenge this very binary way we have of seeing the world. And that binary lends itself to the way we've organised. We see everything kind of through this through this binary lens. And that's how we've organized reality and that you know is in every can be seen in everything from man woman black white um perfect flawed gay straight um what what else beautiful ugly um everything is kind of seen through this through this binary lens and i think that also lends itself to this this idea of this kind of extreme idea of it being one or the other when it comes to makeup and that if you are critiquing beauty culture in any way um that kind of that um alongside with that it's a is a, is a complete rejection of it and that's very much not I'm trying to do like the antithesis of that so I am you know putting beauty culture under the microscope but I'm doing it from the perspective of somebody that like loves makeup and loves loves dressing up and like loves adornment and um kind of loves all of those things so I think really what I'm trying to do is to tap into um, all of the ways that those processes of beautification um, can be can be joyful and can be liberatory, um, and but at the same time identifying the ways in which beauty culture is also like you know oppressive and tyrannical, trying to critique that, but trying to maintain all of the trying to make it more about pleasure than than about pain. The interesting thing is whatever where you go with this conversation say you've really succumbed to the pressures of the beauty standards that exist and you're doing it maybe not for yourself or maybe you're doing it for yourself but you're slapping on the makeup or you've had Botox or whatever it might be or the other extreme end of the spectrum where you've just ditched everything and you're not looking at wearing makeup or doing anything with your hair etc either end are judged. It's not like we're just judging people who have ditched this system. We're judging people who have succumbed to the pressures of it because I'm, I guess, you know, the first, the visual of a human is our first experience of them, whether that's in real life or on Instagram, but certainly in real life, before they've spoken, before we've got a feel of what they're like energetically or we've understood who they are as a person, we all do it. We judge people. We go, oh, I've got their number and it's, none of it's right. We need to get beneath all of it, but we're just judging that. It's it's it seems to make up such a large sum of who we are still. Uh, certainly on that first experience of meeting someone. Yeah, absolutely. And it's often so inaccurate yeah. and and so misleading, you know, the assumptions that we make about people based on these really um kind of like superficial um, these, these these superficial things are often yeah often lead us to um, to sorry are, are often just very misleading yeah and um, what, we're also taught that that tendency is just um, you know it's just kind of human nature and it's just a universal norm that we do judge that we do judge things and we do judge people on site and we make these kind of like immediate assessments of them based on their perceived, um, on their presentation or, or on their possession or lack of possession of, of, of beauty. But in um, my research, I talk about it in Disobedient Bodies, but I it's something that I had kind of come across years ago, um, I think when I, when I was teaching African studies at SOAS, that that is actually something that can be attributed to, it has a name and it's ocular centricism. And it is, um, it comes from, 
a tendency in Western culture um, to obviously we have like many different senses, um, but in Western culture, historically, there has been a tendency to privilege the sense of sight over all of the other senses. But that is actually something quite specific to um Western culture, and it's not necessarily a universal norm. So there are many other cultures that have privileged other senses, and as a result of that would have less tendency to, or actually wouldn't assume that they can make a value judgment or have some sort of insight or intimate knowledge of a thing simply or a person simply based on how they look. So it is something that's actually quite culturally specific rather than just a kind of human universal norm. Wow. I mean, it's so ingrained. It's so ingrained. We it's can't so ingrained. even see that. We just assume it's so the norm that you're making some sort of subconscious decision about who this person is from looking at them. But I find it helpful to know that it is something that we even though you kind of do it as second nature, it is something that we have been conditioned to yep. do. So I find it really helpful to know that there are there are other ways of, of being and thinking, thinking about things, people and reality. So that knowledge, even though I haven't been kind of like socialized in the, one of those kind of alternative um, cultures that I'm that I'm talking about, knowing that they have existed, knowing that these alternatives exist, helps me kind of like question qu- question myself in ways that like I, I check myself and I, f- I feel like I, I am so much less judgmental about um, people's appearances, about other people's appearances than I used to be. Um, when I used to kind of just uncritically reproduce um, what I had been kind of conditioned to do. Um, And yeah, I think a a period of checking myself has just led to where I am now, where it's actually just not something I do as immediately as I used to. Do you think that's come in tandem with you not judging yourself? Absolutely, definitely. Um, I feel that I didn't know this at the time, um, and I think it's something that is um, subconscious often. But I feel that judgmental gaze, um, that judgment that I um, projected onto other people, I was also holding myself to the same. Um, I, I was also, you know, being very, very self-critical, and that was that kind of. I guess judgment that I had of others was reflecting the level of self-criticism that I had about myself and the impossibly high beauty standards that striving for an elusive and never achievable perfection that I was, you know, kind of constantly um, feeling I had to um, I had to achieve was um, yeah, it was it was like the kind of the internal the external was reflecting the internal. Yeah. What what were your experiences growing up in Ireland? What did you believe about your own body? You know, we grew up in the same decade. We will have had very different experiences for certain reasons, mm-hmm. but there were beauty standards that we all saw in, it was magazines for us as kids. Yeah. And magazines were weird. Like you look back at <laughs> 90s magazines and go, how was I allowed to read this stuff? You know, it was questionable stuff and the imagery was all you know, sort of homogenized. What What was your experience growing up and what did you believe about your own body? Yeah, so I grew up um, where the, the dominant, not even just the dominant beauty standard, it felt like the only, the, the beauty standard, you know, kind of exclusively was, um, I think the most important thing was to be very thin, um, as thin as physically as was physically possible um so i guess the ideal would be to be very 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 thin to be tall to be blonde to have long hair blue eyes were definitely a bonus um but uh yeah i i write in the book um about the way there was no fat that was permitted anywhere on the body apart from your boobs they were the only place where um they were the only part of your body that could be that could be big um so that was a beauty standard that i feel everybody that everybody was kind of um stri- to to varying degrees you know striving to achieve um and it was 
oppressive in many ways for 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 everyone. And I feel like even even for people, even for the few people that maybe naturally had all of those features, they were not. So you know, earlier you were saying that this is. Um, hang on, sorry, one moment. Um, earlier you were saying that if women, um, if there's somebody that is perceived as making too much effort, yep. they're pilloried. But if it's somebody, if there's somebody who's seen as not making enough effort, they're also, you know, often vilified. Um, yeah, I've got the exact language that you write for that bit. Well, I've dog the page. Hold tight, <laughs> hold tight. So you're either labelled frigid or a slut. <laughs> Yeah, that was it. As kids. <laughs> that binary. Oh yeah, that was it. As kids. <laughs> so the, my my point is that there's no winners in this. It mm-hmm. was like irrespective of how you behaved, irrespective of how you looked, you were still doing something wrong. Yeah, that's not to say it wasn't better for some people that, or it wasn't it wasn't maybe easier for some people than it was for others. But I feel like even for people who were pole position there was still inordinate pressure and the forces of patriarchy working working upon them as well so my point is that there's kind of no winners in this game but for me personally there was also the added pressure of racism so I was growing up in an environment where there were virtually there was virtually no difference and certainly there were very very few other black people or people of African descent so a lot of the features that so we were very much in an environment where you were um sorry I should probably sit more in front of the microphone. We were <laughs> you very, chill, you relax. <laughs> Anushka's <just> got it. <laughs> sorry, and I'm leaning on this and I'm probably clicking my nails and I'm doing all of these things. No, no, we, you being relaxed is more important than any of it. Don't worry. Um so hang on, where was I? Um Oh yes. So the there was this pressure to be as demi- I'm not used to having these nails. Sorry, I'm writing. I'm, <laughs> I'm writing a feature. But it's quite nice, on, click clacking away. I like it. I I'm into it, but I'm sure the the uh, the the producer is, is less <laughs> into it. I'm sure from a sound perspective, it's highly annoying. So I'm gonna. It's, it's ASMR. Try and it's ASMR. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's happening. Um, okay, let me try and control my hands. Um, so where was that? Yes, there was this pressure to be or the type of femininity that was um, expected of us that we were kind of very much like encouraged to perform was one where you were as diminutive, you were as tiny and f- as frail as possible. So there was this constant pressure to just be very small. And so I was in that environment as well. Um, And I have all of these features that I was just constantly told, you know, were too big. So like everything from my hair to my lips, the size of my mouth, my body shape, um, like the size of my bum, everything about me was too, was too big, um, or I was told was too big. And so I was just very, very, very like self-conscious of my body and I think the pressure to be very thin was um was in enhanced by also what by, by by also what was going on in terms of in terms of race and you know wanting to um not wanting to stand out any more than I already did if that makes sense. Well, the beauty standards are still incredibly Eurocentric. And, you know, I learned a hell of a lot from reading your book, stuff that I'd never read before. Um, a guy, I think you pronounce his name, Peter? Piter? Peter? Oh. Peter Camper. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Peter Camper. And his popularisation um, of the facial angle. He mm. created a sort of summary of exact angles that equaled beauty. This stuff is, this is not new stuff. This is old shit that has been really pumped into the system and we're just stuck with it. And I think it's, it's amazing that we can have these conversations now and go, what is going on? Can we just have, put this all out on the table and have a look at what we really truly believe and what we've just been told and we're sticking to? But of course, when you're a teenager and you're growing up and there is the pressure and the magazines and your peer group, mm-hmm. most of us fit into that category of following suit. And 
the you know we can't talk about bodies without talking about weight and it's a really tricky subject to talk about but it's a really important one for lots of different reasons you know I know that you had a period of sort of disordered eating because of these pressures I had an eating disorder of about 10 years Mm -hmm. sort of highly compounded by the fact that I was on tv at a young age and you've got this imagery of yourself coming back at you and the discomfort of that but it was really interesting reading your points on this and Again, a conclusion that I hadn't landed on, which is the sort of subconscious feeling is that thinness equals willpower. Mm. And actually, it's female obedience is what's really going on here. I, through all of the crazy roller coasters that I've been on with my body, I'd never landed on that. That we see other people that are thin or in magazines, on TV, and we assume they've got more willpower than us and Mm -hmm. that's what creates this level of self-loathing and I'm not good enough and I'm not doing enough I had never landed on that before really no oh well I hope you find it helpful massively (laughs) it's liberating because I think actually I was still there was still a part of me stuck in god there are people that are just more disciplined and willpowered or whatever that was still yeah sort of rummaging around in my subconscious that was still there Mm -hmm. And I think actually looking at it being female obedience is a very different feeling and one which you can quite clearly reject very easily. Like, no, I don't fancy a, a sort of abiding to those rules, thanks very much. Yeah, and this is where the disobedience comes into yes. it and can be can be liberatory um, to to reject um to reject that pressure but what you're saying about that kind of like self-loathing and that idea of like will willpower and like discipline around the body is um is really crucial as well so to, again to go back to the binaries um and our kind of binary view of this vi- binary view of the world that we have um so there is like very long um long standing deep seated um kind of tradition in Western philosophy um, that basically, well, going back to Plato, that separates the body and the mind. So sees the body and the mind as almost two warring oppositional entities. And um, within the binaries that that we have kind of organized reality according to, there's always a hierarchy where between the two, one is seen as superior and the other, the other inferior. And in that mind-body split, the mind is seen as superior, the body is seen as inferior. Um, The mind is seen as the seat of, um, you know, intellect and rationality and has been historically gendered male. The body is has been historically gendered female and is the opposite of rationality and and intellect. Um, And there's very much a sense that the mind has to kind of control and discipline the body and subject the body to um, these, to, to, has to exert this willpower and control over the body. So, and, the, and again, remembering that the body has been kind of historically gendered gendered as female. So we have, and with, within that, there is, yeah, this kind of idea of kind of almost, there's this long tradition of almost like scorn for the body, the body being kind of held in, in contempt. So we have been kind of, these ideas are like very far reaching in our culture. So we've kind of been conditioned for millennia yep. to have this really uncomfortable relationship <clears throat> you know with our bodies when that is when that meets um with kind of like beauty culture when that meets um with kind of advertising when that meets with um the form of you know late stage capitalism that we that we currently live under that has kind of encoded into its dnas into its DNA, this notion of constant improvement, we always have to be, um, you know, we we always have, we have to be constantly, constantly improving. We can always be better. We can always be working harder. We've already been kind of primed um, to think that our bodies are not good enough. Yeah. When that kind of meets with those narratives of constant improvement um, and constant productivity, um, it's a very like kind of fertile ground for these like deep, 
deep kind of like seated insecurities about our bodies to really flourish. Um, and so it's we shouldn't be surprised that we are so kind of vulnerable to these narratives that are that are that are that our bodies aren't good enough and these this sense of kind of yeah self-loathing that many of us have or have had yeah. about our bodies. I'm sure most people listening to this either feel like that about their bodies or certainly have in the past in teen years or later down the line mm -hmm. and slipped into self-punishment and we can do that in so many ways there's obvious ways like over exercising or not eating the right kind of diet that's going to nurture your body and your mind but I think there are subtler ways that I'm probably less privy to how else might we be punishing ourselves without really realizing it's interesting because obviously um exercise and diet are things that um are really are, are really healthy you know and are things that um can be really like obviously contribute very much to well-being but I think um what we have to be mindful of or maybe like even vigilant about is what our um i guess what our motivating energy is what our in, what our intentions are and what our feelings about ourselves are um i was writing something recently about um the kind of the diet culture again of the 90s and how things like like slim fast and <laughs> right like <laughs> it's monster Drink this and have this sugary <laughs> cereal bar and eat nothing else all day. Mm. I saw people. Re I saw someone online uh, on Instagram recently talking about like the special K diet, special like, K <laughs> bars and cereal. Yeah, and like that stuff is just like so processed. I think that bar had some, you know, those bars with that kind of like fake sugary yogurt, yogurt yeah. <laughs> like on top. Like, what on earth is that stuff yeah. doing to? You? To, to your insides. You will you know? never shit again. <laughs> never shit again. But I, like, yeah, you can just kind of feel the con yeah. congestion. Yeah. Um, and I actually did, <laughs> I had really like, like serious like digestive issues and it's probably not un not unconnected to those kind of like um, fad diets. But like, yeah, my, my concern in those days was in no way about kind of health or well-being. It was just about calorie restriction yeah. and look being as, as thin as as thin as possible. So I think when we're thinking about diet and exercise, um, are we kind of focused more on um, our our health and well-being, or are we more focused on trying to achieve a a a, a certain type of potentially not very healthy body type? Yeah. yeah, and feeling, I mean, we all know how if we're feeding ourselves appropriately and fueling ourselves, we're going to mentally feel better. And all of us want to feel better. There's no one else out there who wants to feel worse. So we've <laughs> got to do it for body and mind. We've got to eat properly rather than punish ourselves, expecting that getting to a certain minimal weight will then make us happy. We can't because we're mentally out of balance. The whole Absolutely. thing is totally flawed. And, and you say there's so many interesting points, again, about this flawed system that we're in. And we're still in it. It's not, you know, there's been... Oh, we're deeply in we're it. Deeply <laughs> in it. Yeah, we're deeply in it. And, and you know, the it. interesting thing is, certainly with social media, there's been this influx of uh, a body positivity movement, which is a lovely thing. And mm -hmm. I think it's definitely helped me. It's helped lots of people out there seeing... Um, advocates for looking after yourself and letting your body be naturally as it is and not going to self-loathing and punishment etc yet simultaneously we're under more pressure than ever which doesn't correlate we're under more pressure than ever even though we've got this amazing new movement that's there what's going on yeah so I find that paradox you know kind of like fascinating and it's something that um that I I think about in the book um this conversation around like I guess representation and 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 inclusion and I know like when I think about being a teenager and um like so I'm I guess like a relatively kind of naturally like quite s slim person um not that I thought I was when I was growing up like I thought I was huge but I have a different body shape to lots of my peers in that like I didn't have a gap in my thighs. My thighs are a certain my thighs are a certain shape and there's no gap, they meet. Um and, but I never saw anybody that had a body like that. Now I look at um 
you know, there's lots of women I can think of that now are in the public eye that are held up as being beautiful that have a similar body shape um, to my own. And that certainly would have been helpful for me in normalising um, how I felt about myself. Yet, at the same time, if representation were the solution to this, if we think about people that have been historically well represented, so if we just take a kind of like prototype of like a slim white woman with straight hair who's been, you know, kind of well represented historically, if representation were the solution to this, were the panacea to this, anybody that fits that criteria would then feel great about themselves. And that is absolutely Mm -hmm. not the case because even though people are being represented they're still being represented in a way that is often objectifying um and we are not we are not engaging with we're not really grappling with um this de- this very complicated relationship that we have with bodies in our culture. All we're doing is saying, oh, let's add more bodies into the mix. So while that isn't, of that that is in certain ways helpful, it doesn't go, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't go deeply enough in actually grappling with where these, these ideas, where these complicated ideas about the bodies, about the body come from and how we might overcome them. It's kind of just expanding the existing problematic framework rather than trying to kind of create a new paradigm, which is what I think we need to do. So how, so if inclusion isn't the answer, how do we fix a broken system? You must have the Sorry, answer, big, Emma. <laughs> big <gold of> <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think for, for me, um, what I have found really helpful and I found um, writing the book um, personally um, really helpful in kind of like my journey to feeling more just comfortable in in my own body which is really you know that's sh- that's sh- that should be really uncontroversial that should be really ordinary for us to feel comfortable in it's our own bodies. It's the least ordinary thing. <laughs> it's, it's the, the least, least ordinary right? thing. Right? Yeah. Which is like actually not. Mm. Um, so I think knowing, just kind of knowing some of the history, knowing um, the kind of ways that we've been like conditioned to have these ideas and attitudes about our bodies, knowing that alternative um, ways exist or have existed, that this isn't kind of like preordained, that we that we do have, there are options, there are choices. I feel like that that in and of itself is that that doesn't solve where we are at currently, but I think it opens up a opens up spaces where we can like yeah address address a lot of these issues I hope I mean we're of a similar age and we're also not allowed to age by Mm -hmm, the way mm -hmm. that is the messaging that I'm hearing a lot and Mm -hmm. I'm happily rejecting it I actually feel for the struggles that I've had with my physical body that I'm happy to say I'm in a very good place with how I think about my body in my 40s and I'm the happiest I've been in my skin yeah but with the aging thing Mm -hmm. I don't feel any resistance to ageing at all. Even mm-hmm. though I know the messaging's there, Yeah. for some reason I don't feel called to keep myself looking 15. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to go with it and see what happens. And I know that's not the case for everybody. And mm-hmm. there's, I think, I put a post out on Instagram not long ago where I was talking about if I do this with my forehead, I've got... It's about a thousand lines and if I smile I have you know creases around my eyes and the lines that go from my nose to my mouth as I'm getting older are accentuated yeah, I can hard relate to all of yeah, this and I'm kind of I'm going with it I'm like of course because I move my face a lot and I talk and I'm expressive and yeah that's going to happen and I didn't think it would get much of a reaction but the amount of women that I think actually felt relieved that I was willing to show that my face moved and has creases and crinkles and they have felt deep shame and are a lot of them were saying I am I was literally about to book to go and get Botox for the first time or whatever and now I'm maybe not completely deterred but thinking about just pressing pause on that idea for a bit and I'm not going to sit here and sort of slag off anyone that's had Botox or have any judgment because I think you've got to do what works for you and makes you happy but I don't necessarily want to 
feel swayed or feel like, I don't know, I, I could end up like the only one in sort of the whole of London that hasn't frozen my face. I don't know, but I'm sort of willing to go with that one. But the pressure, I hadn't seen it coming, but it's immense. It's immense to not age. And it's very female specific, that one. Yes, ab- ab- absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's something that, yeah, I'm starting in, in, in my 40s. Um, I'm, I'm really, I am starting to, to think about. I think similarly to what you were just saying, I, um, I am not overly concerned or even like super aware <laughs> of all of like all of those things that you described. Like I don't know what these lines are called. I, we need to give them a name. <laughs> Grilling lines. But, yeah, I, I, they probably they probably have a name, but I'm not I'm not aware of what it is. But yeah, like I I am aw- I'm aware that they're there, and I assume that they weren't ten or twenty years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't I don't really care. But then I also what I do find actually a little stressful is being so. I'm often told people often think I'm a lot younger than I am. And when people find out my age, they are often shocked. But then I'm commended for looking youthful. And that actually, that actually makes me feel, that kind of makes me feel like a little uncomfortable because I'm like, well, if I looked my age, whatever that may be, whatever that's imagined to be, what does that mean? Would it matter? Like, yeah. And, so, but you would never say to a man, I don't think, oh my god, you don't look that. I don't think that's as often the case. I don't think, I don't think age necessarily comes into it, or anyone really looks or cares about how old a man is. The aging process is sort of a given, and there's these terms like silver fox or whatever. Yeah, there yeah. is no equivalent for a woman. You become an old hag, an old witch, an old like, witch. Yeah, <laughs> is the is, is the equivalent it to really silver is. fox. It really is, is the female version. Yeah. yeah. So I think as men get older, you know, they are um, ascribed more kind of um, authority and yeah. power and taken more seriously. Whereas I think um, women certainly if they're daring to show the signs of aging um are have 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 the have the reverse and experience um a lot of women uh describe an invisibility that they um you know experience as they get older so rather than this kind of increase in status it's very much a, a decrease in status but one of the things that i write about in the book as well is the kind of um this fear of female power and spheres um, historically where women, um, you know, kind of had authority and had power were often were often targeted because in different contexts, that authority, that kind of female authority and power was seen as threatening to the status quo. So it was something that was, you know, um, yeah, often very intentionally targeted. And I think that might also be the case with older women that there is this, because I know certainly as I get older, and I think this is uh, this is common, I've, and you've, you've just said something similar yourself, that you feel kind of far more comfortable in your skin and I think with that comes a certain power and authority and like confidence in your in yourself and 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 in your voice and I think maybe that is yeah perceived as threatening so it's yeah. often like there are attempts to to quash it yeah without a doubt you talk really beautifully I mean in in both of your books that I've got here actually don't touch my hair and disobedient bodies about the Yoruba tradition. So this is the culture that you did you did your dad grow up in that culture or he's Yeah, so uh, my dad is Yoruba, um but I I think a lot of like a lot of what I write about in with in with regards to Yoruba culture is pre-colonial Yoruba culture. So my dad grew up in Nigeria, um but my family was like, you know, very anglicized my my brothers um not my brothers my fathers my aunts and uncles were all actually born in Ireland in the 50s my Nigerian aunts and uncles which is highly highly unusual um they went back to they went back to Nigeria but they're like very international um when I spoke to my father about many of the traditions um from kind of like pre-colonial Yoruba culture that I learned not 
necessarily through my family, but through studying and teaching African studies. When I spoke to my father about them, he might not have been necessarily like yeah. familiar with them. I even remember asking my grandfather about um, a philosophical concept in Yoruba and he was an elderly man. This was just um, a couple of years before he passed away. And he he was saying to me that his knowledge of the Yoruba language, even though he could speak Yoruba fluently, he was saying his knowledge of the Yoruba language wasn't actually um, deep enough to kind of translate this philosophical principle that I was asking him about because it was something like very, very old. Um, so these are not necessarily um, concepts that are, you know, prevalent in Nigeria today, but um, they are in the kind of like, they are part of the traditional Yoruba worldview or the traditional Yoruba metaphysics. And also they existed, which they existed is why until we relatively need, recently. Yeah, which is why we need to learn about them. Because actually the way that you describe beauty in that context is entirely different to the one that we're talking about for modern women today in the West. So can you tell us about any of the traditions that are or have particularly helped you in understanding what beauty means to you? Yeah, actually, and there, there's there's an example I can give um, where it's it it's still um, it it is still very prevalent actually, um, and one of the so with this book I was trying to trace where these like um, why we were so why this feeling of self loathing about bodies and. I think specifically weight um, was so recognisable and was so commonplace. But again, even though it's global to a to a certain extent, it's certainly far more pronounced in um, some cultures than others. Um, so I remember um, going back to. So I was born in Dublin, but then I spent the first few years of my life in Atlanta. Um, in the American South and I started going back there as a teenager and spending summers there I still had like a lot of family there and I think as a well I was a teenager but let me say as a, as a young adult that was the first time I'd been around um, a beauty culture that didn't where women being like incredibly thin wasn't um yeah, wasn't wasn't like the beauty standard, and I think like a lot of that has its ante antecedents in. You see that like in in a lot of black cultures, and one of the things I'm doing in the book is trying to trace where attitude, what attitudes towards bodies are like, um, from cultures that emerge out of different philosophical traditions. And so I'm talking in Yoruba culture, um, or, or I'm looking at Yoruba culture, looking at other cultures, and they don't necessarily have that mind. There's lots of non-Western cultures that don't have that mind-body split, don't have that hierarchy between the mind and the body, and don't have this idea of the body as being... Um, one of the quotes in the book is from St. Augustine, and he talks about the slimy desires of the body. They don't have those kind of attitudes to bodies as being these disgusting things that need to be controlled, yeah. that are like overtly gendered as female and need to be disciplined and controlled in that way. So that often they have far healthier attitudes towards people's body types. And I there, I, I have in the book um, an Ariki, which is a praise poem um, to one of the Yoruba Orisha. The Orisha are um, uh, deities in, in Yoruba cosmology. Um, and one of the most kind of well-known, um, uh, one of the most well-known Orisha is a goddess called Ashun. And she is the goddess, amongst many other things, of beauty. But her Ariki, her praise poem, um, I think I actually quoted it in both of those books. So I, I was struck by it. And it exists in such contrast to the beauty culture and attitudes about bodies that I grew up with in Ireland. But it says a corpulent. So this is one of the most beautiful Orisha. And she's associated with beauty and with femininity. And um, her one of her Ariki says, a corpulent woman, a woman who cannot be embraced around the, a, a woman who cannot be embraced around the waist. And I, when I read that, I was just like, wow, that is like the antithesis yep. of, you know, a beauty standard, the, the beauty standard that I grew up in. Mm, I know, but it's so important that we hear about whether it is different parts of the world, different cultures or historic times, because so much of this and we forget this because we're living in the moment is trend led. 
it's not set in stone. It's changing by the bloody week at the moment, even when it's down to like eyebrows. <laughs> I mean, meant to be thin. <laughs> oh shit, I plucked mine in the 90s. Now they're meant to be thick again. And it's we forget that this is all trend led. In 100 years, this could not be the case, we hope, and things will be a lot healthier and much more dedicated towards just health and not trying to overrule the body and quietening the mind on these matters. We don't know, but this is, they're all trends. I think you, you really hit the nail on the head where you say they're they're all trends and also they are all, there's, there's even though the pendulum swings wildly from one um, kind of side to the other, they are all um, based, even, and the trends change, central to them is the idea of at any given time there being a particular beauty standard. And I was really interested in some of the material I looked at from other kind of cultures and times where there wasn't necessarily like a standardised set of features or idea of beauty that every single person or every single woman was expected to ascribe to or subscribe to or conform to rather. But rather beauty was assessed on a more individual level based specifically on that person rather than just this kind of abstract set of features that everybody's supposed to have. And again, I found this proverb in Yoruba, which I found really interesting, um, which it translated in English into one whose beauty is enhanced by their smallpox scars. And I was just like, wow, again, that's just because on this particular individual, the scar, the scars on their face made them more attractive. Um, and, you know, that can be the case. And that's another thing we see um, so often um, we're under so much pressure to have this really kind of homogenized um type of look where everybody kind of has the same features, has the same teeth, has the same face. I feel like and social media is really heightening that. Big time. But it's the idiosyncrasies yeah. um, about the little differences yes, that exist that make people, that pe gorgeous. Make people absolute, absolutely gorgeous. I saw the most stunning woman today. I almost went up and, and, and told her and then didn't. But her her teeth were like very unique to her and if she were to go and have them like straightened and all of the all of those procedures like she was so stunning and her teeth were really really part of how striking and how incredibly beautiful she was and I feel that um those those like yeah those kind of idiosyncrasies that we all have are often are, are often our beauty they are and I think about all of the features that I was bullied for having as a teenager um, and how the pendulum shifted and swung and then they became desirable features. And you think, oh my God, well, what if I had had some kind of intervention to try and change them, trying to keep up with this standard that is just going to completely shift anyway? So I think it's really important that we, I don't know, just uh, like, yeah, that, that, that we have some degree of resistance to all of these um, kind of pressures that are being piled on top of us. Yes, we have to have the resistance because I think, you know, social media, especially with the algorithms showing you stuff that you're already looking at so that you do just end up in an echo chamber of this is what I like and, you, and there's filters and God knows what else going on that we actually forget about our uniqueness and things that are inherently us or it could be a scar that reminds you of something or it could be a tattoo or it could be just something that you don't see anyone else has it's a beautiful thing and, and only we can really own that we can't wait for other people to tell us we've got to feel it but I also like the fact that in the book you talk about beauty being a verb so it's not just something that you happen to be lucky enough to have or that only some people are privileged enough to experience it's a doing it's a doing it's a it's a movement and it's something that is um, you can feel it it's an energy yeah absolutely so again that was something um, that I saw um, in other cultures I speak a little bit about the Navajo people of North America and um, a form of art they have where the finished product isn't actually what's beautiful but it's the process of creating it where the beauty lies and similarly in um a lot of Yoruba traditional visual art, it's not just the image of the thing that it being how its beauty is assessed, but it's actually like it's the, the its meaning and its usefulness. So beauty isn't just this um, passive 
visual thing, but it's actually found in um, relationality and in and in process mm. and in the relationships that exists between people rather and, and between things rather than just in the thing, in the object itself, because that's objectification. Um, so how can we think about beauty, beauty in ways um, that it that are alternative to objectifying? Yes, I think it's the healthiest thing we can do alongside that much needed resistance at a time when the world is very noisy and we are bombarded with imagery on not even a daily basis, on a like second by second basis. We're yeah. just seeing stuff and we actually forget how much it affects us and our self-worth and how we're feeling about our bodies, our faces. It's all part of the same thing, but but it, we forget how much we're being impacted by everything we're seeing. So the resistance is key. It is so key. I love this book and I, I love the term disobedient bodies. I just think it's cracking. You've nailed it with that one. I'm it so just, cute. well, it does what it says on the can. It's like, yeah, be <laughs> free. Stop obeying all of this bollocks and just be yourself and be your, yeah, be your beautiful self. Yeah. So we, we thank you. Um, I feel like we live, we live in a society that, you know, tells us to just be happy with ourselves the way we are, but then makes it virtually impossible <laughs> yes. for us to do so. <laughs> so with this book, I'm actually like trying to provide some kind of like specific tools that people can employ, knowledge that people can have that might actually truly help them be able to to love themselves let in, enjoy enjoy their bodies yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the enjoyment isn't it enjoy your body you've got a beautiful body whatever it looks like whatever it does and can't do it's beautiful yeah. emma thank you so much it's been brilliant talking to you and thank you for being on happy place my pleasure i've enjoyed it immensely thanks for having me 